Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Wednesday, April 14th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's been a very, very busy day, and I had to teach my class um, shortly be before coming on the air tonight. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we have a new section of that class starting up. Uh, it's going to be Saturday, April 24th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you'll find out more information about that. So today was day 13 in the Derek Chauvin trial and the murder of George Floyd. And today was supposed to be uh, some very damaging testimony from the star witness for the defense, Dr. David Fowler. Now, the, the testimony was damaging, but it wasn't damaging for the prosecution. It was damaging for the defense. We saw Prosecutor Blackwell, Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell on cross-examination, totally dismantle Dr. David Fowler's largely idiotic argument. I heard him. I, I watched it today. I've watched all 13 days. I'm going to need therapy after this. Uh, but I, I, I watched all 13 days. And this is the first I've heard somebody suggest that George Floyd died from carbon monoxide poisoning coming from the exhaust from the car. But Dr. David Fowler stated he did not know whether the car was running or not um, because of, of the way George Floyd was positioned and he was near the exhaust pipe of the car. But my thing, my question would be, on cross-examination, if I was a prosecutor, I would ask the question, well, if your argument is that carbon monoxide poisoning led to his death, then who positioned his face near the exhaust pipe? Wouldn't that be negligence on behalf of uh, Derek Chauvin? Uh, who, who positioned him there? He didn't just lay down there vol voluntarily by the exhaust pipe. Who positioned him there? But uh, what we saw today was a clinic on cross-examination. Okay, so uh, we're going to share an excerpt, uh, some excerpts of what happened today. But I was, I, first of all, I was watching the, uh, the witness um, testify and defense attorney Eric Nelson uh, asking questions of him, et cetera. And then I'm listening to these idiotic arguments he's making. And then I knew he was going to get his behind torn up on cross-examination. That's exactly what happened. Defense witness, Dr. David Fowler, gets destroyed by Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell. Then uh, we saw today that the officer, former officer now, Kim Potter, who shot and killed Dante Wright. We saw she was charged with second degree manslaughter. Charges came very quickly. She, she was not only charged, she was arrested. And we have a mugshot of her as well. So her mugshot is making its way around social media. And her mugshot is probably trending right now. She probably never thought she be would be a trending topic. But but she is. So we have a uh, we have a mugshot of her also here. Um, yep. Got her. Got her mugshot as well. Uh, so we have an update on what's going on there. We know we have the fourth night of protests there in Brooklyn Center, uh, Minneapolis, behind the killing of Dante Wright. So we're, we're going to talk about that. And. Um, also, we'll deal with some history as well. April 12th was the anniversary of the founding of the Free African Society in uh, Philadelphia in 1787. The Free African Society, founded by, uh, co founded by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. Uh, we're going to talk some about the history of the Free African Society. It was a mutual aid and religious organization, the Free African Society. 
And contrary to proper belief, you know, this is 1787. This was 1787. This is during the year of the Philadelphia Convention, the spring of 1787, when the Constitution was drafted and signed and voted on. Um, many of us had an identity with Africa. This is called the Free African Society. It's not called the Free Colored Society. It's not called the Free Negro Society. It's called the Free African Society. So we'll talk about uh, that today as well. Now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. Sign up for our email newsletter. Uh, also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. To sign up for our email newsletter also. Okay, I uh, want to jump into this clip here. Let's go to, let's go to clip one, Shakita, uh, before the break. So in uh, Derek Chauvin trial uh, today, defense uh, medical expert Dr. David Fowler testifies on George Floyd's death. Let's go to clip one for NBC Nightly News. Take it off mute. Okay, Dr. David Fowler, an expert witness for Derek Chauvin's defense, testified that George Floyd died from cardiac arrest combined with the effect of illicit drugs and not a lack of oxygen. Dr. David Fowler, the former chief medical examiner in Maryland, did not examine George Floyd's body. The prosecution pushed back during cross-examination. Go ahead, press play. George Floyd's heart has been at the heart of Derek Chauvin's defense. How did the heart and drugs contribute to the cause of death? They were significant. Well, other contrib- they, they contributed to um, Mr. Floyd having um, a sudden cardiac arrest. Today, Dr. David Fowler testified that Floyd died of cardiac arrest combined with the effect of illicit drugs, not a lack of oxygen. Is it your opinion that Mr. Chauvin's knee in any way impacted the structures of Mr. Floyd's neck. No, it did not. Fowler said he would have classified Floyd's manner of death as undetermined due to multiple factors, including this. There is exposure to a vehicle exhaust, so potentially carbon monoxide poisoning. Fowler, who did not examine Floyd's body, recently retired after 17 years as the chief medical examiner of Maryland. During cross-examination, the prosecution came out swinging. I mean, you should do your homework before you arrive at your opinion. Fair enough? Yes. You haven't seen any data or test results that showed Mr. Floyd had a single injury from carbon monoxide. Is that true? That is correct. Because also, Fowler acknowledged Floyd needed immediate medical care to reverse the cardiac arrest. Are you critical of the fact that he wasn't given immediate emergency care when he went into cardiac arrest. Yeah, as a physician, I would agree. This morning, a passenger in Floyd's SUV, Maurice Hall, appeared briefly in court without jurors in the room. I'm here for uh, criminal charges going forward. Hall said he planned to invoke the Fifth Amendment to avoid questions about Floyd's drug use. The judge quashed his subpoena, and he won't be compelled to testify. Defense testimony is expected to continue tomorrow. If and when the defense rests, the prosecution can call rebuttal witnesses before closing arguments. Okay. Um, we're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. Now, people are saying Kim Potter has already posted bail. They always post bail. The police union raises money for them and post bail for them. That's part of the process. That ain't nothing to be. So what? That always happens. They always post bail. That's, that's part of the process. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by. It's 
Stand by, everybody. Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by. Stand by, everybody. How's everybody doing? Okay, we've got Sharon. We've got Sharon, Tammy T, Ruby, Eric. Just a few of the people watching. Stand by. All right, stand by. We'll be back from break in two minutes. Stand by. All right, back from break in two minutes. Okay. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 19 a.m. the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, April 4th. This is Wednesday, April 14th, 2021. We are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Also, if you'd like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? If you uh, support us through YouTube, YouTube takes a third of the donation just so people uh, know that, all right? Okay, so right before the break, um, I was talking about uh, what took place day 13 in the Derek Chauvin trial in the uh, uh, murder of George Floyd. And we just heard some testimony here from uh, Dr. David Fowler. Now, Dr. David Fowler was supposed to be the um, star witness, okay, for the defense. But it didn't go the way uh, the defense thought it would go or hoped it would go all right uh he came off as not really understanding knowing what he talked about and not doing his homework he fell apart on cross-examination from uh prosecutor jerry blackwell who did a fantastic who's, who's done a fantastic job the entire trial basically but today oh my god i was <laughs> i was watching the cross-examination and uh he basically gave a clinic <laughs> okay on how to cross-examine uh, a witness. All right, if we look at, uh, I want to look at this here. Um, let's look at what took place today. Okay, so a uh, defense medical expert says George Floyd died from underlying heart issues. All right, so they, the defense is doing the best they can 
to try to get somebody to say what they want uh, what they want uh, them to say. All right. It wasn't the knee on the neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds that millions of people around the world saw tens of millions of people. It was heart disease. OK, it was all those French fries and pizza that he ate. It was the drugs, et cetera. Now, a forensic pathologist called by Derek Chauvin's defense team uh, testified that George Floyd died from cardiac arrhythmia caused by underlying heart uh, underlying health conditions rather than from asphy asphyxia under the force of Derek Chauvin's knee on his neck, okay? And listening to him, he didn't even say the knee on the neck was a factor. That's what was so stunning about it, okay? He didn't even say the, the, the knee on the neck was a factor, all right? It wasn't that. It was, it was the underlying heart conditions and it was uh, the drugs and all this other stuff. So... Uh, Dr. David Fowler, Maryland's former chief medical examiner, said George Floyd's health conditions, quote, contributed to Mr. Floyd having a sudden cardiac, a sudden cardiac arrest, in my opinion, end quote. Dr. David Fowler also suggested that exhaust from the police car while George Floyd was pinned down and his head was close to the tailpipe may have worsened George Floyd's existing conditions. Well, the question I would ask is who positioned his head near the tailpipe? Wouldn't that be the officers? Wouldn't that be Derek Chauvin, who was on his, who was on his back for nine minutes and 29 seconds? Who put his head near the tailpipe? If, if there was carbon monoxide, now we don't know whether the car was running or not, and upon cross-examination, Dr. David Fowler had to admit he didn't know whether the car was running or not. So you don't know whether the tailpipe is emitting carbon monoxide. OK, but let's say it was who put his head near the tailpipe and who kept his head near the tailpipe. So wouldn't that wouldn't that be a uh, uh, culpability from the defendant? Wouldn't that make the defendant responsible? Dr. David Fowler's testimony comes after Dr. Andrew Baker, the Hennepin County medical examiner who conducted the autopsy on George Floyd, told jurors on Friday, Friday, April 9th, that heart disease was a factor in Floyd's death. He said it was a factor. He said it was a contributing factor, but it wasn't the main factor. It was a contributing factor, but it wasn't the main factor. It wasn't the top of the list. The opinions of Dr. Fowler and Dr. Andrew Baker, however, conflict with a number of prosecution's witnesses who conducted who concluded that George Floyd died from low oxygen levels under police restraint. Last week, Dr. Lindsay Thomas, a forensic pathologist, testified that the primary cause of George Floyd's death was asphyxia or low oxygen due to the activities of the law enforcement officers. Dr. Martin Tobin, a physician in um, uh, pulmonary and critical care medicine, similarly testified that George Floyd died from a, quote, low level of oxygen, end quote. Now, earlier in the day, Maurice Hall, the friend who was with George Floyd on the day of his fatal arrest, invoked his Fifth Amendment rights and refused to testify, okay? Um, I want to go to this next clip here. This We're going to go to clip two, uh, Shakita from... Uh, the readout with Joanne Reed. Uh, prosecution dismantle dismantles defense defense witness theories about cause of George Floyd's death. Prosecution dismantles defense witness theories about cause of George Floyd's death. All right, let's go to uh, clip two. Minneapolis Police Officer Derek Chauvin continued presenting his case today, putting on the stand Dr. David Fowler, a former chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland. In stark contrast to the medical witnesses we heard from the prosecution, Dr. Fowler testified that the cause of George Floyd's death was well, pretty much everything except Derek Chauvin, from Floyd's heart condition to drugs and even carbon monoxide poisoning because Floyd's head was close to the exhaust pipe of the responding squad car. Yeah, you heard that correctly, an exhaust pipe now on trial. So it shouldn't surprise you that Fowler's entire testimony, frankly, imploded once prosecutor Jerry Blackwell picked apart his findings during cross-examination, starting with debunking the theory that Floyd died, in part, 
due to vehicle fumes. Do you know if, in fact, the car was on or not? You didn't see any information or data from anybody who says, I either turned the car on or I'm the one who turned it off. You didn't see either one, did you? Correct. Was the car even on? Fowler, who had ruled out asphyxia in Floyd's death because of a lack of bruising on his neck, then admitted to Blackwell that bruises are rarely even a thing with this type of death. Do you agree, Dr. Fowler, that... Uh, the majority of cases where somebody dies of asphyxia are very subtle and, in fact, no traumatic manifestations are visible at all. That is correct, depending on the circumstances. Prosecutor Blackwell then nullified the studies Fowler had cited showing that restraint in a prone position with or without body weight does not cause difficulty breathing. Is it true, Dr. Fowler, that none of the, of the form restraint studies that you referred to actually studied uh, subjects who had someone's knee on their neck in the prone position? Is that true? That is true. Uh, none of the studies uh, went for as long as nine minutes and 29 seconds. Is that true? That is true. That, my friend, that is how you tear down a defense witness, by getting him to remarkably agree with the prosecution. Joining me now is Philip Atiba Goff, co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, and Mary Moriarty, former chief public defender of Hennepin County, Minnesota. And Ms. Moriarty, I have to start with you first. Uh, that was a pretty uh, clinic. It was pretty much a clinic the prosecutor put on uh, in dismantling this witness. What did you make of, uh, of that exchange today? <laughs> Uh, it was a really effective cross-examination. Um, when he started out talking about the exhaust fumes, uh, I, I almost thought at the beginning, okay, well, that, that seems so implausible. I'm almost glad that he's taking that position. He also was rendering opinions, giving opinions on cardiology, pulmonology, um, toxicology, and Mr. Blackwell got him to admit he doesn't have expertise in any of those areas. And if you recall, the state has called a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, and a toxicologist. And uh, Mr. Blackwell got Fowler to admit um, he would defer to the opinions of a pulmonologist a number of times. So it was a really effective cross-examination. It was amazing. And, you know, I, I had my, my Howard class today and I said to them, you know, one of the things that you want to really do is always know who you're talking about. Right. And so this, this gentleman, you know, who, I, I, you know, he embarrassed himself a bit today. He got a little bit embarrassed today. He's a former Maryland official. Um, he, he was here in, uh, in Maryland. Um, he cleared, he was somebody who had cleared police in a previous um, police killing. Um, he cleared police in, in the death of a man called Anton Black. Um, in 2018, Anton Black died after three Maryland police officers were on top of his body for nearly six minutes. They continued pressing down on him for many minutes after he was handcuffed. Fowler's autopsy, because he was the guy in charge of that, the autopsy report ruled the death an accident and said there were no signs that police did anything wrong. So he's basically mostly an expert in saying police did nothing wrong. Your thoughts on that choice of somebody to testify for the defense, Philip? Well, what we saw all of last week was everybody and anybody who could line up and get a spot from the Minneapolis Police Department saying, yeah, that was wrong. It's out of policy. Um, uh, there's no best practice that says it's okay. Absolutely kneeling on somebody's trachea until they die is something we don't like to do. So I'm frankly impressed that the defense was able to get anybody with any kind of degree to come forward and say, maybe there was something else. And I want to be clear that if they left him up on the stand, he might well have said, you know, there's no evidence that aliens did kill him. Right. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. This is a person who no longer has that position. No longer requires And that's what you're going to need to controvert everything that we all saw. We saw public lynching this summer. Everyone saw it. A random MMA fighter came by and called the cops on the cops. That's what we heard from last week. So you are going to need a fabulous to come in and provide anything like a shred of a credible uh, uh, a story in the, in the other direction. And if you're even remotely prepared, as the prosecution was in this case, that's going to fall apart almost instantly. you got to be glad about that and also 
Yeah. This take on one trial, right, on, on, on one officer, is so far short of what we're seeing protesters talk about in the streets of Minneapolis today. That, that is a very good point. It's true. And, and I think that people are, are, are thinking about, well, they're trying to you know, process all of these cases at once. So they're trying to process the fact that this other officer is now being charged. But you are seeing, listen, in Minnesota, at, at least now we've had three officers charged uh, in deaths uh, of civilians. Uh, the only one convicted, um, as was noted in the last block by um, Johnny Cobb, is the black guy who killed the white lady. But it, it does feel like there is more momentum for, toward prosecutors at least trying, right? Philip, and is that what it's going to take? We've seen Marilyn Mosley try. We've seen other prosecutors at least say, you know what, we need to at least attempt a prosecution. Is that, in your view, progress? I mean, I, I don't. I, I'm less embarrassed by the prosecution in this case. It, it's, it's been incredibly thorough. That's great. But it's not just the prosecution coming forward and doing their job effectively and professionally. It's, always, it's also the profession saying, please don't pin this on us. But part of what's happening is, if there is a not guilty, God help us all. And I think everybody in law enforcement understands there's no way to do the job if this is somehow part of what people. So everybody's coming together saying, let's accept this. Let's make this the one random error that doesn't indict the entire profession. And, yeah. and so, yeah, you're seeing, you're seeing some momentum in that way. But I don't think that that generalizes. I don't think that's going to uh, happen in the Dante Wright, uh, Wright case. And I don't think that makes us all safer or makes black people feel like, oh, now it's good with us as the cops. Well, and right. And, and Mary Moriarty, the other group of people that have had a credibility issue are prosecutors. Because we've seen even Democratic prosecutors who get votes from black people refuse to prosecute in cases like the Mike Brown case and cases like Breonna Taylor. And so prosecutors are sort of under the spotlight, too, uh, because we do have this sense that, you know, white citizens are treated as citizens and black citizens are treated as subjects. And they're simply the people who police uh, police on, uh, but not the people that, that police protect. In your view as a prosecutor, coming from the point of view of the partners of the police, what do we need to do to get off of this dime? Because this is not a place that's sustainable. Well, remember that this case was taken away by the county prosecutor and given to the attorney general, um, mm. partly because of that very issue. Uh, I, I see the potential for tremendous change here. Our community, this, this didn't start with George Floyd, obviously. Um, there's a history with the Minneapolis Police Department that people in our community, particularly in our black community, have been trying to bring to the attention of police, of policy officials, and it's been ignored for years and years and years. George Floyd was like our Ferguson moment. That was just kind of the eruption of all of this trauma, this tension, uh, this anguish over what had been happening to people in our black community for many, many years. And I don't think any of us wanted to go, well, we're not going to let it go back to the way it was. It's not going to go back to normal. There's tremendous pressure and actually willingness on a lot of our policymakers part to make changes, um, yeah. to see that this, I mean, it obviously did happen again right in the middle of this trial, um, but there's tremendous momentum here to try to change this. I'll also say to uh, uh, Philip's point about the MPD getting on the stand and, and saying this isn't who we are and what we do. Right. So there is, people in the community have noticed that, and of course, people in the Black community know, and as, as a former public, or a public defender, I know, I see body cam where yeah. police treat uh, people like this all the time. It's or it is what they do. Always exactly. Yeah, it is yeah, what they the do. Problem. It is what they yeah. do. That's the problem. They're yeah. treating black people as yeah. subjects and not as citizens, and that is the problem. Philip Atibagoff, Mary Moriarty, thank you both very much. Okay, pause it right there, Shakita. Uh, check out Dr. Philip Atiba Goff. Uh, I think it's G-O-F-F. -F. Uh, Dr. Philip Atiba Goff. He has a lot of good research. Um, he um, uh, has research dealing with uh, biases among police officers. Also, Dr. Philip Atiba Goff, G-O-F-F, -F, all right? Uh, a couple of quick things here. So Dr. Fowler conceded multiple points, including that a lack of bruising and other injuries do not prove that George Floyd did not die of asphyxia and that the weight of Derek Chauvin's gear was not factored into his calculation of the force applied to George Floyd's neck. So you, you have to wonder, where they get this guy from, okay? Well, uh, let's look at the updates from 
Washington Post. I want to look at a couple things here, and then we're going to uh, go. Uh, we're going to stay in Minnesota and go to Brooklyn, Minnesota, and what's taking place with uh, uh, Dante Wright. Uh, defense expert says Derek Chauvin did not cause George Floyd's death as cross-examination grows tense. Okay, now, uh, Dr. David Fowler is, is being sued over a quote-unquote chillingly similar case in Maryland where video footage showed officers struggling with Anton Black, an African-American man named Anton Black, before pinning him down. Anton Black died. Dr. David Fowler deemed Anton Black's death an accident and no officer no officers were charged in the death, as uh, Joy Reid was uh, saying. Um, from today's testimony, prosecutor pushes back on factors that medical experts says contributed to George Floyd's death. Uh, prosecutor Jerry Blackwell pushed back on factors, that's the African-American prosecutor, Jerry Blackwell, pushed back on factors that medical expert David Fowler had assessed as contributing to George Floyd's uh, death. Under cross-examination, David Fowler affirmed that George Floyd did not show signs of overdose, such as sleepiness, though Fowler testified this, quote, does not exclude, end quote, a potential depressive effect from drugs. Uh, the prosecutor also brought up uh, Dr. David Fowler's earlier suggestion that a tumor called uh, peri uh, periganglioma could have secreted adrenaline that further compromised George Floyd's heart, okay? Uh, Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell asked, quote, 90% of perigagliomas do not secrete adrenaline. Is that right? Dr. David Fowler said that was probably right. He, Prosecutor Blackwell just went through step by step by step and just totally dismantled uh, Dr. David Fowler's uh, argument. Quote, now you're... Now, you're not telling the jury, are you, sir, that Mr. Floyd died from paraganglioma, are you? Uh, Prosecutor Blackwell said, and Dr. David K. Fowler was forced to say no. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, then the other, the other big thing that, I mean, because the more he talked, the more he helped the prosecution. The more Dr. David Fowler talked, the more he helped the prosecution. Defense medical expert concedes George Floyd should have received medical attention. Well, he should have received it from the police because they're trained to give first aid. They're trained to give uh, uh, a CPR. They didn't do that to, to George Floyd. George Floyd should have received immediate medical attention to reverse his cardiac arrest, conceded Dr. David K. Fowler, who's a paid expert witness for the defense. <laughs> He's the defense medical expert. He's saying uh, George Floyd should have received immediate medical attention. During cross-examination, Dr. David Fowler acknowledged that George Floyd might have survived if he got emergency help after Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell inquired whether George Floyd died suddenly. Okay? <laughs> Once again, so <laughs> it's like, wait a second, you, you actually paying this guy? You... <laughs> you actually paying this witness for the defense? Are you sure? <laughs> Unlike the prosecutor's medical expert, not the David Fowler said his death was not immediate, opening the door to a question from the prosecutor about whether it could have been prevented. So his, Dr. David Fowler's insane argument opened the door for Jerry Blackwell to say, wait a second, uh, are you saying his death could have been prevented? Quote, cool. are, are you critical of the fact that he wasn't given immediate emergency care when he went into cardiac arrest, Prosecutor Blackwell asked? Dr. David Fowler, once again, was forced on the witness stand, oath, penalty of perjury, to say, as a physician, I would agree. <laughs> the, the admission follows testimony from the prosecution's witnesses that Derek Chauvin did not respond to George Floyd's call that he could not breathe by halting his restraint and offering medical help. Okay, so so read through this. It's like uh, I printed out. It's about eighteen pages worth of um, uh, uh, recap of what happened today. I don't have time to do all of it, but I, I want to switch over quickly here 
to the um, uh, New York Times. I want to switch over quickly here to the New York Times. And I want to look at key moments in day 13. Uh, they talk about the case of Anton Black. Let's scroll down. David Fowler, chief medical examiner of Maryland, said he believed George Floyd died from cardiac arrhythmia. Um, it, it, let me see here. Where is that? Okay. 2019, Derek Chauvin's, def okay, Derek Chauvin's defense called on Dr. David Fowler, who retired as Maryland's chief medical examiner in 2019 and has a history of involvement with high profile police use of force cases, has a history of involvement in high profile police use of force cases to testify uh, to testify on Wednesday as an expert witness. Okay. Now, um, at the request of Eric Nelson, defense attorney for Chauvin, uh, Dr. Fowler said he reviewed medical police and ambulance record ambulance records as well as toxicology reports and video footage among other information in the George Floyd case uh let's see here let's skip over that he said it was medical okay I want to go to this here in December okay while he while he was chief medical examiner of Maryland, Dr. David Fowler ruled that the death of Anton Black, a black teenager who was killed during an interaction with the police in 2018, was an accident the Baltimore Sun reported. No one was charged. In December, Anton Black's family filed a federal lawsuit against Dr. Fowler, the officers involved in the incident and others. Two years, uh, quote, two years before George Floyd died after being restrained and pinned down by police, 19-year-old Anton Black uh, was killed by three white law enforcement officials and a white civilian in a chillingly similar manner on Maryland's eastern shore, end quote, the lawsuit reads. In that case, um, In that, in that lawsuit, officers restrained Anton Black in a prone position for around six minutes after he had been tasered and handcuffed as he struggled to breathe, lost consciousness, and suffered cardiac arrest. In 2015, Dr. David Fowler, Dr. David Fowler's office issued a homicide uh, ruling in the death of Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old African-American man from Baltimore who died of a spinal cord injury after a widely circulated cell phone video showed him being dragged, screaming into a police transport van. Okay, so Dr. David Fowler's office issued a homicide ruling in the death of Freddie Gray. Um, in that case, six officers were initially charged with crimes including manslaughter and murder. The first trial ended in a hung jury and three more officers were acquitted after trials before a judge. Uh, okay, so read the, read the rest of this here from New York Times. Okay. okay, key moments on day 13 of Derek Chauvin trial. All right, now, uh, I wanna switch over to uh, Dante Wright. Okay, we're gonna go to clip three, Shakita. So today, the uh, former uh, Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Potter, 26-year veteran, was indicted and she was charged for the uh, killing of Dante Wright. Uh, I want to go to clip three. Let's go to uh, NBC Nightly, Nightly News. Arrested and jailed, facing a charge of second-degree manslaughter in the death of 20-year-old Dante Wright. In a statement, prosecutors say Potter abrogated her responsibility to protect the public when she used her firearm rather than her taser. Her action caused the unlawful killing of Mr. Wright, and she must be held accountable. Potter was shot and killed Wright during a traffic stop. The now former officer on the force for 26 years, training a rookie cop that day during what police have called an accident. 
law enforcement analysts count at least 16 similar cases of guns mistaken for tasers in the last 20 years, not all fatal. No comment today from Potter's attorney, the police union, or the family of Dante Wright. Wright family's attorney speaking out. Obviously, they are glad she got charged. They do hope and pray for a day that we will get equal justice. You, me, and anybody else with this skin color would be in silver handcuffs right now with murder charges. Today, angry reaction to the manslaughter charge from activists involved in three straight nights of protest. Now you can see the crowd getting restless, getting stirring even more. Overnight, at least 79 arrests as police clash with demonstrators and enforce the curfew. Now, some protest leaders comparing Potter's case to that of former Minneapolis police officer Mohammed Noor in 2017 a black officer convicted of murder and manslaughter after shooting and killing a white woman who called 911 for help. Some see a different standard for the white officer killing a black man. Do you think she should be charged with murder? Yes, I do think she should be charged with murder, clearly and unequivocally. Why? Because of her reckless conduct. Ron, any idea how the manslaughter charge will play with the crowds out there tonight? More people seem to be arriving here earlier tonight. They are not satisfied. The officials are pleading for peace as the clock ticks toward another curfew. Okay, so that is from uh, NBC Nightly News from uh, April 14, 2021. Uh, former Minnesota police officer charged in shooting of uh, Dante Wright. Uh, we see a fourth uh, night of protests. Uh, we see as protesters confront uh, the police over the fatal shooting of Dante Wright, hundreds of demonstrators gathered for a fourth night outside a, a police station in suburban uh, Minnesota on Wednesday, protesting the fatal shooting of Dante Wright, carrying signs that said Black Lives Matter and no justice, no peace. A crowd assembled in the rain outside the Brooklyn Center, uh, a Minnesota police station and confrontations between protesters and law enforcement officials uh, began or, uh, near, began nearly immediately. Let me flip over here to updates from uh, New York Times. Just a second here. Okay. Uh, fourth night protests. Uh, for, for a fourth night, protesters confront uh, the police over fatal over a fatal shooting. Okay. You see this here. Let's see, carrying signs that say Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace. A crowd assembled in the rain outside the Brooklyn Center, Minnesota uh, station and confrontations between protesters and law enforcement uh, officials began nearly immediately. We're going to go to clip four in just a second, Shakita. After, near, after several skirmishes in which protesters threw bottles of water and milk, the police fired several uh, flash bang grenades over the crowd. Uh, they used pepper spray and fired marker rounds uh which can stain clothing shortly after 9 p.m eastern standard time the i guess 9 p.m Eastern standard time the police declared the assembly unlawful and ordered the crowd to disperse but hundreds of people remained some trying to shield themselves with wooden barricades state troopers arrived helping to clear the scene okay news that uh kimberly a potter the officer who fired the shot that killed uh, Dante Wright had been charged with second degree manslaughter, drew mixed reaction from activists. Uh, Ariana Buford, 25 of Brooklyn Center, said the potential penalty seemed light given Mr. Pot Mrs. Potter's long experience as a police officer. Quote, the charges need to be more severe. She's been an officer uh, longer than I've been alive. Uh, Kevion Ford, 45, a, pri a private contractor from Coon Rapids, Minnesota, said the charge was appropriate given the police claim that Miss Potter had shot uh, Dante Wright by accident, appearing to mistake her handgun for a taser, but he worried that she would not be convicted. Um, it's, one, it's very hard to convict a police officer. Two, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 jurors that if you're trying to get a, a, a higher, uh, a more severe charge, you have to prove intent, which goes to state of mind. They may bump up the charges a little bit, but they're going to charge, especially especially if uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison takes over this case. But they're going to charge based upon the evidence that they have, what they think they could get a conviction on. Whatever they think they can actually get a conviction on, that's what I want them to go with.
trying to get a, trying to get a more severe charge to appease the public and then you end up losing the case because you can't meet the standard the burden of proof is on the prosecution not the defense the burden of proof is on the prosecution trying to get a more severe charge to appease activists and protesters and people outraged and then you end up losing the case because you can't prove the elements of the charge no you you charge based upon the evidence that you have and what you reasonably think you can get a conviction on okay um okay look we, we, we're out of time here on 9 10 a.m superstation wfdf those watching on facebook and youtube keep watching we're going to go for a few more minutes we're going to go to this other clip that deals with also the distinction between uh manslaughter and murder charges then we're going to talk about the free african society and also we have breaking news from the house judiciary committee in the vote on uh hr 40 to vote on the reparations bill hr 40 we have breaking news on that as well uh so watch me on our facebook fan page the african history network our youtube channel michael m hotel we're going to keep going right now it's correct wrong behavior is not over till we win we're kind of forever uh stay tuned for democracy now we'll talk to you tomorrow night peace okay all right stand by stand by let's go to this uh let's go to this next story doing reparations i got this update a few minutes ago but we were uh still going um let's see here okay so on my sunday show the application network show on sunday uh i i spoke with cam howard of Encobra, uh national coalition of blacks uh for reparations and we were talking about uh hr 40 giving an update on that and we were talking about this vote that was taking place in the house judiciary committee today if we uh go over to uh, the reporting from the washington post because i got an update uh from the washington post dealing with this house committee approves bill to create commission on slavery reparations supporters call it long overdue well yeah it's long overdue but one you got to vote the right people in the office two america needs a massive history lesson they've been trying to get hr 40 passed for 33 years um a house student so this is from wednesday april 14. A House Judiciary Committee on Wednesday approved legislation to create a commission to make recommendations on paying reparations to descendants of enslaved people. The furthest the bill has advanced in its first, it, 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 the furthest the bill has advanced, it was first introduced more than 30 years ago. So it, introduced, it was introduced in 1989. This is the farthest HR 40 has gotten, okay? As expected, the vote broke up, uh, broke on party lines by 25 to 17. No Republicans voted for it. No Republicans voted for it. Just like no Republicans voted for the American Rescue Plan, okay, in the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate. Not a single traitorous Republican voted for the American Rescue Plan in the in the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate, okay. So you think they're going to vote for reparations? They wouldn't even vote to help white people that voted to put them in office. You think they're going to vote for reparations? Now, this, now this vote has to go to the full uh, House floor. It takes 218 votes to get any bill passed in the House of Representatives. They're not at 218 yet. They're at about 173, 174, from what Cam Howard told me. Uh, they expect to maybe get up to 190, hopefully, but you need 218. Hopefully they get to 218, but then it has to go to the Senate and you need 60 votes in the Senate and they don't have 60. Okay. I don't even think they have 50 to tell you the truth. There's 50 Democrats, including, uh, the two independents, Senator Angus King from, uh, Maine and Senator Bernie Sanders from Vermont. I don't think Joe Manchin's going to vote for this of West Virginia. I don't think Joe Manchin's going to vote for this. I don't think Kristen Sinema of Arizona is going to vote for this. They're Democrats. You're not going to have any Republicans to vote for this in the Senate. Okay, which means you got to vote more people into the Senate who support H.R. 40 and vote Republicans out of the Senate. Okay, because not a single Republican is going to support this. Uh, the Black Tea Party Republican, Tim Scott of South Carolina, he already said he's not voting for reparations. If 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 if, if the black Republican is not going to vote for reparations, how many white Republicans you think are going to vote for it? Tim Scott has, has already said he ain't voting for reparations. If the black Republicans not going to vote for reparations, how many white ones you think are going to vote for it? Now, advocates of reparations pushed uh, pushed it to the forefront last year 
as racial justice protests were held across the country following more police killings of African Americans, including George Floyd in Minneapolis. And it became an issue during the Democratic presidential primary contest. Okay. Now, because a lot of people are asking the, 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 the uh, Democratic presidential candidates where they, st where they stand on reparations. Now, um, as I said, I'll say the same thing then as I said, not, as I say, I'll say the same thing now as I said then. Why are you focusing on the president? Why don't you focus on Congress? Because reparations has to pass the House of Representatives and has to pass the Senate before it goes to the president's desk to be signed into law. The main focus shouldn't be on the president. It should be on Congress. Especially the Senate. Because you, you need 60 votes in the Senate and there's only 100 senators. Now, on Wednesday, April 14th, the legislation's uh, supporters held the vote as a historic step. It is a historic step. I agree with that. It is a historic step. But we have to understand the full process. We have to understand the full process. And if, if no Republicans in, in, in the House Judiciary Committee voted for this bill, well, if they're not going to vote for a bill to study reparations, you think they go vote for one to pay reparations? So this is significant, but we have to understand the long game. You got to vote more people in the office who support reparations and support other bills that are beneficial to African Americans and others, and vote people out of office who are blocking these bills. It's not that simple. I mean, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. It's pretty simple. If you Pay attention to politics. Quote, here we are today marking up for the first time the history of the United States of America. Any legislation that deals directly with the years and centuries of slavery of African Americans, of African American people who are now the descendants of those Africans. Here we are today marking up for the first time in the history of the United States of America, any legislation that deals directly with the years and centuries of slavery of African American people who are now the descendants of those Africans, said Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, Democrat of Texas, who has introduced the legislation every Congress since its original sponsor, Representative John Conyers, the Honorable John Conyers of Detroit, when he re retired in 2017, she added that the bill would serve as a necessary first step on a, quote, path to restorative justice, okay, on a path to restorative justice. Now, all the people, all these black social media talking heads talk about Democrat, Democrat, they ain't doing this, they ain't doing this, they ain't doing this, they ain't doing that. Well, but they don't talk about what Republicans are doing to us. Not a single Republican in, in the House Judiciary Committee supported this. How many Republicans in the House of Representatives you think gonna vote for this? You had 146 Republicans in the House of Representatives that voted not to certify the 2020 presidential election and overturn the votes of African Americans. How many, how many of them you think gonna vote for this? Not, not a single Republican in the House of Representatives voted for the American Rescue Plan. The, the $1.9 trillion coronavirus bill, the American Rescue Plan, not a single Republican in the House of Representatives voted for it. 146 Republicans in the House of Representatives voted not to certify the 2020 presidential election and to overturn the votes of African Americans. How many, you think are going to vote, how many of them you think are going to vote for reparations? Zero. That's how many. Now, maybe Burgess Owens, I'm not sure if he has chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He used to play football. Listening to him, he sounds like he does. Maybe Burgess Owens will fall asleep and hit the wrong button and vote for it. But then he's going to wake up and say, oh, I mean to vote for it. I need to correct that vote. You may have that happen. Burgess Owens is a black Republican from Utah who, who, in 2019, spoke at the uh, reparations hearing in the House of Representatives on June 19, 2019, but he spoke out against reparations. He's, he's black. 
he spoke out against reparations. He's a Republican. Whether the bill will receive a vote by the full House is unclear, and the legislation faces a steep climb to make it into law. You write about that. House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer told reporters Wednesday that he will begin to consider, now he's from Maryland, House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer from Maryland, told reporters Wednesday that he will begin to consider when to schedule it for a floor vote for the full House of Representatives. Oh, you're going to have some Republicans show their entire ass. Jim Jordan, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Louis Gohmert of Texas, uh, uh, Matt Gates of Florida. And Matt Gates ain't busy looking through photos of women, you know, if he shows up to the vote, to the debate. And if he's not, he may be busy looking through photos of women. I don't know. He may be busy trying to consult with his attorneys because Matt Gates is in deep water, right? He's in deep trouble right now. But it is unlikely to be considered soon. This vote is unlikely to be considered soon. Now, Representative Steny Hoyer said he hopes President Joe Biden establishes a commission similar, similar to the one detailed in the legislation if Congress fails to act it. The White House has said Joe Biden backs the legislation, but, but has not commented on whether he would create a commission on his own. I think he should create a commission on his own. It may, it, it, it may, it, see, we have to back up and look at something here. Donald Trump created this 1776 project, okay? Y'all remember that, the 1776 project. And Joe Biden correctly dismantled the 1776 project. Now, the 1776 project, what this did was this present, uh, he, he, he created this commission, they created this report that presented a revisionist view of history, okay? Because Americans are very ignorant of history, and I don't mean that in a belittling uh, manner. I'm talking about understanding history and what's taught in the schools and what's not taught in the schools. Um, because um, Americans are very ignorant of history. And also we know that you have this attack that's taking place right now on what can be taught in the schools regarding racism and things like this. For instance, if we look at if we look at this article from Politico.com, and this is from a couple months ago, this is from January 4th, January 24, 2021, uh, state Republicans push new voting restrictions after Trump's loss. State Republicans push, oh, okay, that's not the one I want. Uh, that's not the one I want. I want the one dealing with um, uh, racism in, hold on. I want the one dealing with uh, racism being taught. I mean, Republicans cracking down on what can be taught in the schools. Uh, where is that one? There's one from um, let me go into my bookmarks. There's one from News1.com, for instance. And this deals with um, let's see here. Is this it here? Just a second. Um, where is that? Well, you have uh, Republican state legislatures cracking down on what can be taught in schools dealing with uh, slavery and racism. Okay. And you have an attack on the 1619 project also. And we saw that with the um, we saw that with the 1776 project that uh, Donald Trump commissioned.
Uh, okay, I'm not sure where that one is. Try to pull this up. All right, but anyway, uh, you can you can Google that topic here. I think uh, I took down those articles that I had up. But you you, you have this you have this taking place now. So uh, Joe Biden can do a commission. It, really, he should do one to deal with the history of this country. OK, to tell the truth, to deal with the real history of this country, do a commission dealing with that uh, and then do a report. Uh, and then also he can do one dealing with um, reparations. OK, as well, do the, the study reparations, the impact, make recommendations, et cetera, and have uh, uh, on his commission. Uh, historians, political scientists, constitutional law experts, attorneys, constitutional law, law experts, things like that. OK. And America has to be educated on this history. Americans are very ignorant when it comes to history. There are. Uh, we've talked about this here on the show before there is. You have the study from. Um, um, Alabama.com has the article dealing with how two, almost two thirds of Americans can't name the three branches of government. Let's see here, three branches of government in Americans. Let's go to this article here from Alabama.com. Uh, one in five Americans can't name the five branches of government. If we look at this from Alabama.com, uh, back January 19th, CBS News uh, ran the story, uh, CBS This Morning ran the story January 19th, 2021, how most Americans don't know what's in the U.S. Constitution. We talked about that here on this show. All this ties into understanding history. Most, most people don't really understand the history of slavery in this country, okay, and how slavery evolved. Uh, one in five Americans can't name a single branch of the U.S. government. This is from September 19th, 2019, okay. Um, Let's see here. A recent survey, a recent survey found America may need to go, go back to the civics class. Uh, Annenberg Public Policy Center's civics knowledge survey found only two in five American adults or 39 percent, only two in five American adults could correctly name the three branches of government, executive, legislative and judicial. That figure was the highest in five years, up from 32% last year in 2018, up from 32% in 2018. So two, only two in five Americans, or 39%, could correctly name the three branches of government. Almost two-thirds of Americans could not name the three branches of government. And one in five Americans, one in five uh, U.S. adults, could not name any branch of the U.S. government. OK, so check this out. So then this ties into people's understanding of law, people's understanding of history. All this is connected. And people people may have to people may say, well, what does that have to do with getting reparations passed? Well, these people who don't understand the Constitution and can't name the three branches of government, don't understand law, don't understand history. They're represented in the House of Representatives. By dumbasses like Jim Jordan and Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Louis Gohmert. They're, they're represented by people in the uh, in the House of Representatives as well as the Senate who are ignorant of history, who don't understand a lot of this stuff also. Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama couldn't name the three branches of government. and he, He's a new U.S. senator. There are only 100 U.S. senators. He's a new U.S. senator. He couldn't name the three branches of government. Not only could he not name the three branches of government, he had no understanding of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. He had no understanding of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and he's going to he's going to vote on uh, on um, uh, the, the bill to strengthen the Voting Rights Act. 
He had no understanding of this. This came up in a uh, interview. And if you just uh, Google Senator Tommy Tuberville, see, Tommy uh, T U B E R B I L L E, and uh, three branches of government. Oh, let's see. Let's do voting rights act. Tommy Tuberville and voting rights act. Uh, let's see here. Huffington Post. Alabama Senator Tommy Tuberville struggles to discuss voting rights act because he's ignorant. He's ignorant. Talk about a talk about a dumb Bama. Let's look at this. Now you, you have to pe people have to understand it, it's not just about your senator. It's about the other ones in the Senate because they all vote on the same bills. It once they go to the general floor out of the out of committee and they go to the general floor. Alabama Senator, Alabama Senate candidate Tommy Tuberville struggles to discuss Voting Rights Act. He's probably just as ignorant about it now as he was then. This is from um, September 17th, 2020. So this was before, uh, three months before the November 3rd presidential election. Alabama Senate candidate Tommy Tuberville struggles to discuss Voting Rights Act. The Republican and former college football coach stumbled when asked his position on the landmark 19 civil, 1965 Civil Rights Act. OK, um, let's go to this clip here. Let's, 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 hold on. Let's, uh, you got to hear this. Good question. Uh, speaking of history taught in school, do you support extension of the Voting Rights Act? Oh. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the thing about, the thing about the Voting Rights Act is, uh, uh, it's, you know, you, 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 you there, there's a lot of different things you can look at it as, you know, who's it going to help? Uh, you know, what direction do we need to go with it? Um, uh, I think it's important that, that with everything we do, we keep secure, we keep an eye on it. It's run by our government, and it's run to the to the point that we it, it it's got structure to it. It's like education. I mean, it's got to have structure. Uh, now, for some reason, we look at things to change to think we're going to make it better, but we'd better do a lot of work on it before we make that change. What the hell did he just say? Now, the bad thing about it is, is he actually won? He he's a U.S. senator now. So not only will he be voting on the Voting Rights Act that he doesn't understand, he also be voting on reparations if it ever comes up in the U.S. Senate. He's a, he's a, this was when he was running. He was a candidate for the Senate. This dumbass actually won. <laughs> I say he actually won. OK. So, uh, uh, check this out here. Alabama Senate candidate Tommy Tuberville struggles to discuss Voting Rights Act. <laughs> okay. So, this, see, I'm trying to explain to people the process because people, are, they're going to be uh, refreshing their screen, going into that bank account, looking in the mail for a reparations check. And I'm like, uh, you don't, I don't think you really understand this process. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Let me, uh, I want to go to, let's go back to the article from the Washington Post, okay? And the, uh, uh, the breaking story here that um, H.R. 40 has been voted out of committee for the first time in history ever. Uh, and it's going to go to a general floor vote. Don't know when, but it will. House committee approves to create commission on slavery reparations. House committee approves to commit committee on slavery reparations. Let me go back to this here. All right. Now, also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal. PayPal.me. 
forward slash the ehn show paypal.me forward slash the ehn show or at our website africanhistorynetwork.com okay if you do it through uh cash app be sure to type in dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w it'll, it'll come up it'll say michael and it'll show my picture there also all right okay let's continue let's flip back over to washington post and we're going to get to this last story here and not to get out of here um so representative steny hoyer of maryland house majority leader uh yeah house majority leader steny hoyer said he hopes uh president biden establishes a commission similar to the one detailed in the legislation if congress fails to act the white house has said biden backs the legislation but has not committed on whether he would create a commission on his own now the bill with HR 40 would establish a 15 person commission that would study the effects of slavery and racial discrimination in the United States from before the country's founding to today, before the country's founding to today. The commission would then submit to Congress its findings and appropriate remedies uh, on how on how to best compensate African-Americans. And I said before, ain't no way in the hell the majority of the compensation should be in the form of money. Or you know in the hell 100% of the compensation should be in the form of money. We all got a half million dollars a day or $250,000 a day. You know damn well white people have it all back by this time next week. And the only thing we would have done is stimulate their economy. One of the things that... Um, I've talked about this before. When you deal with reparations, you're talking about repairing the damage that was done, repairing the damage of what? Repairing the damage of slavery and Jim Crow segregation and what happened after slavery. Okay. To repair means to make whole again, to restore you to a state before the damage was done, to make whole again. To deal with reparations for African Americans, we have to study and analyze who African people were and what we had before we were put into the institution of slavery thinking that slavery means back wages is not reparations that means you don't understand history and you don't understand what happened to african people and what we had before it was taken away from us we were people who had our history our culture our language our spiritual systems our cultural identity okay our cultural identity was tied to self-esteem we had our family ties we had our family names we had our mores our folklore our, our our customs we had our celebrations that came out of custom customs whether it's first fruit harvest celebrations whether it's uh uh, uh, uh all, the, all different types of cultural celebrations that we had whether it's different times of the whether it dealt with different times of the year whether it dealt with um uh astronomy whether it dealt with uh, different seasons we had all we had all of that intact we had our cosmology intact cosmology deals with uh understanding the universe uh, understanding the universe as an orderly system our cosmology we had our cosmogony cosmogony deals with understanding the origins of the universe your spiritual systems are connected to your history and to your culture we had our language all all that was intact that makes people a whole people that's largely been stripped away from us and then we have a european cultural values well european uh cultural system a european cultural paradigm their values etc imposed upon us and we've largely been taught to see reality through the eyes of europeans we've largely been taught to hate ourselves most of us still have our slave masters names etc and then you're going to think that you're going to compensate the people who been through all that and had all that taken away from them and giving them a check is going to compensate them for what was taken away. No, it doesn't. And all we're going to do is give it right back. And you haven't even addressed the laws and policies that are put in place, the redlining, housing discrimination, uh, uh, the, the not just the wealth gap, but the wage gap. Home ownership, the home ownership gaps, uh, about 75, 76% of white Americans own homes, only about 44% of African Americans own homes. 146, our, our, our homes are valued at about $146 billion less than white people's homes. Well, that all comes from laws and policies that have been put, put into place that created these structural inequities. You have to correct the laws and policies 
that were put in place that caused the damage. That's part of reparations also. Reparations is not just a check. If you don't correct the laws and policies that were put in the place that brought you to this point, then after we spend the money, two, five, ten years from now, we're going to be having the same conversation. Those disparities are still going to exist because you didn't correct the policies and laws that were put in place that created the disparities in the first place. Just, just cutting the check does not address that. If you think it does, that means you don't understand history and don't understand what happened. So repairing the damage, the repairing the damage has to be comprehensive. But first you have to understand and assess the damage that was done to understand how to repair it. This is why you have to understand history and law. You have to understand what happened to us. Okay. So the legislation uh, is H.R. 40 designated as such. So, so the commission would then submit to Congress its findings and quote unquote appropriate remedies on how best to compensate black Americans. The legislation is H.R. 40 designated as such to reflect the 40 acres and a mule that the U.S. government promised and later rescinded enslaved people after the Civil War Special Field Order Number 15. And that only applied to coastal land in, in, Cal, in, in California, uh, coastal land in Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. They applied to coastal land in Georgia, South, Carol, South, South Carolina, and Florida. While Democrats are largely on board with the proposal, Representative Lou Cor uh, Correa, Democrat from California, used the moment to argue the nation should also issue an apology to the Mexican-American community which has also faced discrimination and deportation over a century. Okay. Um, and now, when you study the history of about the last maybe 150 years or so, the relationship between the US and Mexico, and you look at the Mexican American War of 1846 to 1848. You look at Europeans wanting to take over the entire North American continent, including Mexico. You look at in the 1930s during the Great Depression, the U.S. is going to deport about 1.8 million Mexicans back to Mexico. About 60 percent were born here legally. Mexican-Americans, about 60 percent were born here legally. OK. A. An apology the U.S. should issue an apology to Mexico. But we don't want to commingle that with reparations for, uh, for the enslavement of African people and the damage that took place during slavery. We, we, it, it, that, should, that should be a separate um, fight, a separate issue. Um, It does involve African history because you had uh, about five to 10,000 enslaved Africans who run into Texas, I mean, sorry, who run from Texas into Mexico because there was a Southern Underground Railroad going from like Texas into Mexico also when, when uh, Mexico won its independence. And we know the second president of Mexico was a former African slave named Vicente Guerrero. So the so the U.S. should issue an apology to Mexico, and we know that the Mexican American War that's over that's over land. The U.S. wanted land for Mexico, and the Mex Mexican American War ends with the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and in that treaty, the U.S. gets. Colorado, the land that makes up what we today we call Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, and Nevada, those six states the U.S. gets from Mexico in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and it's that treaty that ends the Mexican-American War. So, yes, the U.S. Sh should issue a apology to Mexico. But that's a separate issue. Yeah, they should. But but that's a separate issue. Uh, let's continue here. 
And when 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 you look at what happened during the um, uh, Great Depression, and the U.S. is deporting one uh, up to one point eight million uh, Mexicans back to Mexico. The reason why they deported them is because the U.S. said, and this started under Herbert Hoover and continued under President Roosevelt. The U.S. said that these Mexicans were taking jobs away from white people during the Great Depression. Now, what they didn't talk about is how the Mexicans contributed to the U.S. economy and what they produced, but also what they consumed, what they bought how they contributed to the economy. They didn't deal with that at all because they contributed to the economy also. No, people don't want to talk about that. When you talk to economists, they'll tell you that. But a lot of the average person doesn't understand this. Read this article here from July 12, 2019. I've done an entire presentation dealing with this. The U.S. deported a million of its own citizens to Mexico during the Great Depression. This is from History.com. History.com is official website of the History Channel. Up to 1.8 million people of Mexican descent, most of them American-born, were rounded up in informal raids and deported in an effort to reserve jobs for white people. This, this happened here in the, in the USA, the, the land of the free and the home of the brave. This is during the Great Depression. So I agree that the U.S. should issue an apology to uh, Mexico. I, I agree with that. They should issue an apology to the Congo. They should issue an apology to Haiti. You know, they should issue, they should issue an apology to South Africa. Yeah, I agree with all that. But those are those are separate issues, though. Okay, so check out this article here from uh, history.com. All right. So, uh, Representative Lou Correa of uh, Democrat from California used the moment to argue the nation should also issue an apology to uh, the Mexican American community which has also faced discrimination and deportation over a century. Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee voted against the measure, surprise, surprise, arguing that reparations would force citizens who have no history of enslavers in their family or who have family members that fought to abolish slavery to have their tax dollars used to pay for the misdeeds of others. But but wait a second. I, I remember back um, during the 2000, 2009 stimulus bill uh, under President Obama. I remember under the stimulus bill, almost $200 million was paid in reparations to Filipino Americans. You, you all remember that? Uh, that was in the stimulus bill. Let's let's look. Let's go look at this here. Let's look at this here from CNN.com. Because so, some people have uh, amnesia. Uh, U.S. to pay foreign Filipino World War II veterans. U.S. to pay forgotten Philip. U.S. to pay forgotten Filipino World War II veterans. This is from February twenty third, two thousand nine. I have to, I have thousands and thousands of articles archives. Archived more than sixty years after reneging on a promise to the hundreds of thousands of Filipinos who fought for the United States during World War II. The U.S. government will soon be sending out checks to the few who are still alive. 
For a poor man like me, $15,000 is a lot of money, said 91-year-old Celestino Almeida. Well, now this is taxpayer dollars. Now, this is taxpayer dollars from taxpayers, and many of them weren't alive when the original deal was made. But this is taxpayer dollars going to this, going to pay for this. Still, he said, quote, after what we have suffered, what we have contributed for the sake of democracy, it's peanuts. It's a drop in the bucket. During the war, the Philippines was a U.S. commonwealth. The U.S. military promised full veterans benefits to Filipinos who volunteered to fight. More than 250,000 joined. Then in 1946, President Truman signed the uh, Resision Act, the Resision Act of 1946, taking that promise away. Oh, so you, you're, you're all a bunch of reneggers, right? This is what you are. You reneged on the deal. You're a bunch of reneggers. Today, only about 15,000 of those troops are still alive, according to the American Coalition for Filipino Veterans. A promise tucked inside the stimulus bill that President Obama signed calls for releasing $198 million that was appropriated last year for those veterans. Now, it's appropriated by Congress because Congress appropriates money. The, bill, the ability to tax and spend based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the U.S. Constitution is the power of the purse, and that's controlled by Congress, the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. That's the U.S. Constitution. That's basic constitutional law. Those who have become U.S. citizens get $15,000 each. Non-U.S. citizens get $9,000 each. Quote, I'm very thankful, said Patrick Ganillo, or Ganillo, 80, 88, the coalition's president, quote, we Filipinos are grateful people, end quote. Well, that was taxpayer dollars going to pay for this. That's $198 million. That's, tax, that's taxpayer dollars. A lot of people whose taxes went to pay for this, they weren't alive when the deal was made. They weren't alive during World War II. So what well, you didn't hear a whole lot of people denouncing this and saying, oh, well, my ancestors weren't alive when this happened and I wasn't alive when this happened. Why are my taxpayer dollars going to this? If we look very quickly also, and we've talked about this before, how the U.S. economy has lost $16 trillion dollars. Um, over a 20-year period of time, not 246 years, just a 20-year period of time, the U.S. economy has lost $16 trillion from the year 2000 to the year 2020 because of racism and discrimination. We look at this, this study from um, Citigroup, Citigroup Bank, Came out September 2020. We're going to post a link here to the article from CNN.com. Racism has cost the U.S. $16 trillion city group fines. Interesting thing here, it talks about how racism is hurting everybody. And if you can correct these structural inequities, the U.S. economy can grow by $5 trillion in five years. Uh, America could have been $16 trillion richer if not for inequities in education housing, wages, and business investment between, uh, between, black, between black and white Americans over the past 20 years, new research concludes. The study released this week by Citigroup Bank, by Citigroup, is the latest in a body of research that attempts to quantify that attempts to quantify the economic impact of systemic racism. 
Citigroup arrived at its $16 trillion figure after estimating that African-American workers have lost $113 billion in potential wages over the past two decades because they could not get a college degree. That deals with discrimination. That deals with uh, uh, lack of finances. That deals with the racial wealth gap, all that. These are all legacies of slavery. The housing market lost 128, uh, the housing market lost $218 billion in sales because African American applicants could not get home loans. That deals with redlining and discrimination when it comes to home loans. That deals with um, the racial wealth gap, also. And people who have college degrees are more likely to have higher incomes in general. African Americans have college degrees in general, more likely to have higher incomes. Then you also, this also deals with the racial wage gap as well. And it ties into things like African American women making between 62 cents to 67 cents on a dollar that the average white male makes. The average African American woman has to work 20 months to make the same amount of money that the average white male makes in 12 months. About $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the economy because African American entrepreneurs could not access bank loans. What's more, the U.S. could have $5 trillion in gross domestic product over the next five years if those gaps and others were closed today, the study indicated. If those gaps were closed today, the study indicated. The U.S. could have $5 trillion in gross domestic product over the next five years. So read the rest of this here. Okay. Um, 44% of black households own homes in 2019 compared to 74% of white households. All right. So you're dealing with the home ownership gap as well. These are all legacies of slavery. And what happened after slavery. So it was beneficial for everybody, for America to, to correct these structural inequities. Now, if we go back to the article from uh, Washington Post, Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee voted against the measure, arguing that reparations would force citizens who have no history of enslavers in their family or who had family members that fought to abolish slavery to have their tax dollars used to pay for the misdeeds of others. But 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 people are benefiting from a country that was largely built on on slavery and the policies put in place after slavery ended that mal distributed wealth upon resources to the hands of europeans racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race so dumbass jim jordan of ohio i knew he was going to say something he said quote spending 20 20 million dollars in taxpayer money to reach a conclusion you already know what it's going to be look everyone knows how evil slavery was wrong as wrong can be but this is not something we should be passing that jim jordan needs to be voted out of office and then dumbass uh burgess owens republican from utah one of the two black republicans in the house of representatives char characterized the legislation as portraying black communities as helpless while ignoring their successes he's an idiot Former football player, I wouldn't be surprised if he has brain damage from playing football. I wouldn't be surprised if he has chronic traumatic encephalopathy. He says, slavery was and still is an evil. Reparations is divisive. It speaks to the fact that we are a hapless, hopeless race that never did anything but wait for white people to show up and help us, and it's a falsehood. Well, did the same thing apply to... Native American nations that got reparations, the same thing applied to them, is repairing the damage that was done. Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, at, now, what you have to understand is just as people, just as the average people are ignorant of history, they're represented in Congress by dumbass people like this, Burgess Owens and Jim Jordan. And there's more of them. And these are people who will be voting against reparations. They exist in the Senate also. 
You got to understand it was stupid ass people that voted them into office. This is why America has to have a massive history lesson because people are operating based upon nonsense like this. Representative Sheila Jackson Lee asked her Republican colleagues to put politics aside and acknowledge that the commission would serve as a form of closure that black Americans and the country need after generations of discrimination and disparities. See, people like Jim Jordan don't want to deal with the real history of the country because then they don't want to deal with the fact of the laws and policies that were put in place to maldistribute wealth pond resources to the hands of Europeans. And they don't want to deal with the fact that it wasn't because they were smart. It wasn't because of hard work that many white people became successful. It wasn't because of that. It was because of the laws and the policies that were put in place that gave them help, that gave them a boost. Because if the common denominator to being successful in this country was hard work, then African Americans would be the most successful people in the history of this country. Who worked harder than a slave for 246 years? Who worked harder than domestics? Who worked harder than uh, the butlers? Who worked harder than sharecroppers? If, if hard work was the common denominator and the key to success in this country, then African Americans would be, would be the most successful people in the history of this country. That reminds me of the uh, uh, study that came out in April 4th, 2018. April 4th, 2018. Five of these people in this study voted for people like Jim Jordan and Burgess Owens. 40% of whites think black people just need to try harder, poll fine. 40% 40 of white people surveyed think that African Americans would be equally as successful as white people if they just tried harder. That means they have no understanding of history. Then they go vote for ignorant people like Jim Jordan and Burgess Owens to represent them in Congress to vote on bills. And these people, th these people represent them are just as ignorant as they are. Forty percent of this is from April fourth, two thousand eighteen. Newsweek.com. What's significant about April fourth, two thousand eighteen? Well, that was the fiftieth anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Assassinated April fourth, nineteen sixty-eight. Forty percent of white Americans think black people would be just as well off as white people if they worked harder, according to a new poll from YouGov on Wednesday. Forty percent of white respondents agreed that black people just needed to try harder to be equal, while just eighteen percent of black respondents said the same thing. I wonder if they surveyed Burgess Owens because he probably would say that Burgess Owens and Larry Elder and Paris Denard and Candace Owens. They would they would just say, "Oh, they just need to try harder." So uh, read this article here. All right, now. Let's go back uh, to the Washington Post, done with HR 40. Free African Society, we'll have to get to uh, Tuesday night. Uh, I mean, Thursday night. Uh, Jackson Lee asked her Republican colleagues to put aside politics and acknowledge that the commission would serve as a form of closure that black Americans in the country need after generations of discrimination and disparities. Quote, this is the basis of this commission to be able to look globally at the issue of slavery as the original sin and the brutality of it and to then take the journey as it looks at the stark disparities in the African-American community. See, people like Jim Jordan and Burgess Owens, they don't want to deal with why those disparities exist. 
why the structural inequities exist, why the disparities in health and education, all this stuff exists. That deals with laws and policies. And your zip code largely, the zip code has a large impact on your health, your access to health care, your access to hospitals, pharmacies, grocery stores, okay, uh, fresh food, produce, things like this, uh, the amount of pollution coming from uh, plants and things like this in your communities, that largely has to do with zip code. Zip code has to do with income. And your resources, your assets, where you can afford to live. The um, quality of water in your city, in your zip code, okay? That has to do with where you can afford to live. Where you can afford to live largely deals with your, your education level, your income level, the, the career you have, the type of job you have. All this is connected. That quote, that is the basis of this commission to be able to look globally at the issue of slavery as the original sin and the brutality of it. And then to take the journey as it looks at the stark disparities in the African-American community, says Sheila Jackson Lee. I hope we will not take the opportunity to point blame or cast any actions of racism as one party or the other. It was America's sin. And that's what we hope to address. It was America's sin, and that's what we hope to address. Now, Republicans did not heed her request, of course. Dumbass Louis Gohmert of, of Texas introduced an amendment that would make the Democratic Party pay for the commission's fees, quote, since it's the only relevant entity today that supported the institution of slavery, end quote. Throughout U.S. history, it failed on a voice, the, 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 that uh, amendment failed on a voice vote. He says, since it's the only relevant entity today that supported the institution of slavery. Well, first of all, for the majority of the time that slavery existed, you did not have a Republican or a Democratic Party. Louis Gohmert, the, the Democratic Party wasn't founded to 1828. OK, the Republican Party was founded in 1854. But what I do remember is the compromise of 1877. When Democrats conspired with the Republicans, Republicans conspired with Democrats and Republicans agreed to remove the Union troops out of the South upon the Democrats request. And this ended Reconstruction. So Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republicans candidate in the 1876 presidential election, could become president because neither uh, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes or uh, 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 Samuel um, Tilden uh, had enough electoral college votes to become president. I do remember the compromise of 1877. Now, in response to uh, Louis Gohmert of Texas and other Republicans who made similar arguments that the Democratic Party bears responsibility for slavery, I don't, I don't even. Majority of the time slavery existed, there was no Democratic Party. Representative Hank Johnson, Democrat from Georgia, argued that, quote, white privilege is bipartisan and continues to plague the country, as seen recently when members of the mob that started the Capitol uh, a riot on the insurrection on January 6th held Confederate flags. You're dealing with white supremacy and racism, not a political party. R racism existed before the Constitution was signed. But you're dealing with white supremacy and racism, not a political party. I do remember the comp. I do remember the li the Lily White movement in 1928, when Republicans were working to push African Americans out of the Republican Party, and that's why we went over to the Democratic Party. And Republicans in 1928 wanted to get Herbert Hoover elected as president and defeat a, a moderate uh, Northern Democrat named Al Smith. So. Republicans appeal to uh, Southern segregationist Democrats and five former Confederate states to get them to vote for Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover won the 1928 presidential election. And Republicans were ignoring the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s. They were ignoring, they were ignoring the, the issues and concerns of African-Americans. 
So we started leaving the Republican Party, going over to the Democratic Party. I, I remember the Lily White movement in 1928. I noticed that Louis Gomer and Jim Jordan and, and a lot of these other Republicans, Burgess Owens, they, they don't want to talk about the Compromise of 1877, which ended Reconstruction. And they don't want to talk about the Lily White movement in 1928, which is why African-Americans started leaving the Republican Party, because we were being pushed out. Quote, slavery was indeed ended 150 years ago, but racism never took a day off and is still alive well in, well in America. Uh, Representative Hank Johnson said before referencing uh, black Americans who have recently been killed by police. Quote, you can ask family members of Dante Wright, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, or George Floyd. Black folks in this country cannot keep living and dying like this but will be forced to do so if white folks in america continue to refuse to look back at history now several democrats on the on the committee took issue with comments from republicans particularly representative tim McClint, uh McClint, mcclintock of a republican of california who said the bill was quote evil in its intent end quote and will cause division in the country. What the hell do you think we have right now, dumbass? You have division because people are ignorant of history. Now, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas said, when someone in this room calls this evil and that this brings about evil, I, can, I cannot accept that. I'm offended. Representative Cory Bush, Democrat of Missouri, said that hearing Republicans dismiss a reparation study poured salt in the wounds of families like hers that have stories in their histories of separation, slavery, rape, and lynching. Not to mention land that was stolen. And, and see, African-American farmers losing 92% of their land over the last 100, 100 years. It's, uh, a lot of that having to do with being discriminated against getting government loans from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That's a legacy of slavery. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race that comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. Quote, Representative Cory Bush of Missouri said. To the Republicans who are against this legislation. How dare you? How dare you nearly all white panel? How dare your nearly all white panel put so much energy and abuse your power? Is it, how dare your nearly all white panel put so much energy and abuse your power to deny justice for the descendants of uh, one, one of the most egregious atrocities in the history of the world? You have no idea what that's like. You don't know what's that, what that's like. But the least that you can do is support research. Well, see, they're too dumb to read. This is why they don't support research, because they're too dumb to read the research. So read this article here. This is from the Washington Post, April 14th, 2021. House Committee approves bill to create commission on slavery reparations. Supporters call it long overdue. It still has a long way to go because you have idiots like Louis Gohmert, Jim Jordan, black collaborators, traitors like Representative Burgess Owens. You have people like that, they're going to be voting against this. And that's just in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, you got Senator Ted Raphael Cruz, you got uh, Senator uh, uh, Hawley. Josh Hawley, uh, you got people like uh, Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, he blocked the Juneteenth bill that was sponsored by Senator uh, um, um, Cory Booker and Senator Kamala Harris. He blocked the Juneteenth bill from being signed into law and it was going to make Juneteenth a federal holiday and give white people the day off from work. 
if you can't get a Juneteenth bill passed in the Senate, how you get a reparations bill passed in the Senate? So we'll talk some more about this uh, Thursday. Uh, I want to go to this last clip because we didn't we didn't get to it. Free African Society. We'll talk about on uh, Thursday show. Want to go to this last clip here? This uh, is dealing with uh, Dante Wright, and we got sidetracked and didn't get to this clip. Uh, this is from MS. MSNBC, uh, Katie Turr show, and it talks about the quick charges against uh, ex-officer Kimberly Potter, but also it deals with um, a wide manslaughter charges instead of murder charges as well. Gives a good breakdown of that also. Okay, we'll go to this clip here in just a second. Uh, Want to let you all know that we're going to have a new section of the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, this new class is going to start up Saturday, April 24th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Saturday, April 24th, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a uh, it's going to be a uh, nine-week, 18-hour online course that deals with thousands of years of history and deals with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So uh, when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, scroll down, you see the information about the, the radio show We're on six days a week, Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this is my show from March 15th, the day after the Grammys. We dealt with Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion and uh, them performing WAP at the Grammys, and we dealt with negative corporate control hip-hop also. Um, so check that out. And this deals with the, of course, so it was eight weeks, and I had to add an additional week. We're wrapping it up here on our Tuesday on Tuesday nights, but we have a new class starting up. Uh, so we're going to start up on Saturdays. because Saturdays tend to work better for some people also. It works better for me because that's the only day I'm not on the radio. And it's it's a it's a struggle um, doing a class on Tuesday nights uh, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. and then turn around and do doing my radio show at 11 p.m. So Saturdays will work better. And then if I need to go past two hours uh, on Saturdays, I you know I, I have time to do that also. Um, so we have uh, okay so. You click here, we have a flyer here for the online course also. Uh, you click here to register here, it takes you to the next page. Click here to enroll. It's regularly $130 on sale, $80. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place also. I, I do the class live. You can watch from around the world. All the sessions are recorded. If you miss anything, you can go back and watch it over and over again, watch as much as you want to. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. It's a ton of information. We deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, we do it the ancient African presence here in the Americas going back at least 51,700 years ago, including in, th in this country. We deal with the Khoisan, uh, African people were here in this land tens of thousands of years before Native Americans even came into existence. So I'm going to post the link here. This is the link here for our Tuesday class. You can register for that, and I will automatically enroll you in the new Saturday class. But when you register, you can watch the previous classes because those are all archived. There's bonus content also, okay? So this is ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Okay. And when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start in the 15th century. Uh, we can't start in the mid-15th century. We have to deal with thousands of years of history, what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, we talk about ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, Nubia, 
uh, Ethiopia. So we talk about the Nile Valley region of Africa, and we also have to deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who take the teachings from ancient Kim and ancient Egypt into Europe. And these teachings are going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. All right, I wanna to go to uh, this last clip here. This is uh, dealing with um, officer, former officer Kim Potter being uh, charged and arrested here. Let's go, this is uh, the significance of quick charges in Brooklyn Center, but also it deals with the difference between uh, murder and manslaughter charges. I was NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky, who is in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez, who is in Minneapolis, former chief public defender for Hennepin County, Mary Moriarty, and managing partner of the Cochran firm, California and civil rights trial attorney, Brian Dunn. Everybody welcome. So Morgan, I do want to start with you. Uh, this arrest, what more can you tell us? Yeah, Katie, good afternoon. We know that this arrest came after those charges were made official around 11 o'clock this morning local time uh, here in Brooklyn Center. We're told that uh, Kim Potter turned herself into the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension earlier today about uh, 1130, where she uh, faces the charges of second degree manslaughter. We expect those charges to be uh, officially filed later today. Uh, she should be being processed as we speak. Uh, already in response to this, we've heard from Ben Crump, the attorney representing the family of Dante Wright, who acknowledged that this is a step in the right direction, but made it very clear that this, in their eyes, was not an accident and that she intentionally pulled that trigger, firing the fatal shot that killed a 20 year old Dante Wright on Sunday afternoon following that traffic stop for expired tasks. Uh, we potentially anticipate to hear from the family later today. Uh, in the meantime, the seen around the police station here in Brooklyn Center very much reinforced. You can see that high fence, the National Guard Humvees and troops stationed in and around that area. At last check, we know 3,000 National Guardsmen are now here in the Minneapolis area ready to respond should protests grow out of control. We know that last night there were nearly 60 arrests near where I'm standing uh, following, following another night of protests. Police choosing to use uh, tear gas, in some cases rubber bullets, to disperse those crowds that were out after the curfew. No word yet on if that curfew will be in place tonight uh, or uh, what, if any, protests will be, follow, will be coming following the news of these charges against that 26-year veteran uh, who submitted her resignation yesterday. Katie? So, Mary, what do you think of the charges here, the probable charge, second-degree manslaughter? Uh, it's... It's angering a lot of people and puzzling a lot of people because it's the it's also a charge that Chauvin is is uh, accused of, and it's the least serious charge that he's accused of. So I've certainly seen a lot of of talking about why isn't this intentional or why isn't it third degree murder. Uh, so there are a lot of calls for the charge to be changed. There are also calls for this case to be removed from the county attorney who charged it, who uh, puts in time uh, giving legal advice to the chief of police association in Minnesota. And so people have called for the case to be removed from him and given to the attorney general's office, which is the entity that's charging or prosecuting the Chauvin case right now. The AG's office declined to do so, though. They thought the county attorney would be well suited to handle this. Mary, what about the, the, the speed uh, with which uh, Kim Potter has been charged? Usually it takes a, a little bit longer than that. And I wonder if all of the unrest we've seen in Brooklyn Center and all of the heightened mm -hmm. uh, uh, pressure out there, given the Chauvin trial, meant that this was done a little bit faster. I'm sure that's true. If you'll remember to last summer, there were numerous calls uh, for the police officers, former police officers in the um, George Floyd case to be charged. And when he wasn't charged, that's when a lot of the protesting happened. That's when a lot of the unrest happened. And unfortunately, that's when some of the damaging ha damage happened as well. So I'm sure they were well aware uh, that it was important if she was going to be charged to get those charges out as quickly as possible. Brian, what do you make of these charges? Have you just heard Mary Moriarty say there's a lot of people out there who think that she should be charged with third degree murder? Well, I don't know if there's enough there for that. And uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, this exact phenomenon has happened uh, two times in the past in my career. 
where an officer has uh, fired a real gun and mistakenly believed that they were firing the taser. Uh, that is something that is more easy to occur than most people may think. And when we start talking about the concept of intent, the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was not a mistake, but rather it was something that this officer intended to do. And in light of the mechanism uh, that can cause uh, an officer to draw inadvertently uh, draw a firearm, I think that the charges are probably well placed at this point. Uh, let's switch over to the Chauvin trial, which is happening again just a few miles away from all of the unrest surrounding uh, the, the death of Mr. Wright. Uh, Gabe Gutierrez, a new defense that we are hearing today that we had not heard before, that George Floyd died of possible carbon monoxide poisoning. How's that going over in the courtroom? Uh, hi there, uh, Katie. So, yes, that uh, partial defense uh, came from the defense's witness that was called this morning, Dr. David Fowler, who you mentioned earlier was a former uh, chief medical officer in Maryland. And he said while he was questioned that potential carbon monoxide poisoning as a result of exhaust from that police squad car was a potential contributing factor to George Floyd's death. And Dr. Fowler has said that it was not lack of oxygen uh, that killed George Floyd, but that he died due to cardiac arrest combined with illicit drug use. Now, Katie, we expect the prosecution to hit back hard on this potentially this afternoon uh, during cross-examination. The court is in a lunch uh, recess right now, but Dr. Fowler is seen as one of the defense's most crucial witnesses. Um, the prosecution came up with several medical experts uh, previously, uh, late last week, um, and early this week that really stressed the point that George Floyd died due to asphyxia, due to lack of oxygen as a result of Derek Chauvin's actions. And so now the defense is really trying to bring up this witness who uh, some legal experts are saying are, you know, throwing out other potential reasons to cast uh, some doubt in at least one juror. Because, Katie, you have to remember, they only need to, you know, create reasonable doubt within one juror to end up with a hung jury. So this is seen as a very crucial witness uh, for the defense. It will be very interesting to see how the prosecution, um, you know, hits back during cross-examination. All right. So we saw how uh, prosecutor Jerry Blackwell destroyed uh, Dr. David Fowler uh, in cross-examination. Okay, guys, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, remember, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. When you do it through Cash App, type in dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W, and it'll show my name. Uh, it's, it'll say Michael, and it'll show my picture there. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting six days a week, and, and pay some of the bills also. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, right now it's correct, wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Um, we'll talk to you Thursday night. Okay, peace. Take care.